Hello everyone! This is the first part in a series of videos about procedural generated worlds in games. Most of you probably know what a procedural generated world is. After all, a lot of games are using this feature. Minecraft, Binding of Isaac, as well as many other roguelikes and survival games. There are many different kinds of procedural generated levels. You can have procedural generation based on a large complex formula to create a world with its own intrinsic rules. This is often done for outside areas with attributes like humidity, temperature, height difference, etc. The other way is to have predefined chunks that are then just arranged in a semi-random order on each world generation. This works well for roguelikes and indoor levels. One defines the rooms beforehand and based on difficulty and theme, rooms are selected and arranged in a certain way for the player to play through. Finding the right algorithm to create interesting worlds is challenging and requires a lot of iterations. However, there is one part of the picture that is often overlooked when talking about generation of procedural worlds. How can you make the game run at 60 frames per second without hiccups? That is the question we want to find an answer for in this video series. Of course, we are using the Godot game engine for that, but the topic is general enough that the gained knowledge can be applied to other engines as well. Enough with the intro, let's take a look at what we are working with. This is our game. The small white capsule is our player, and around the player we generate the world with different colored cubes. There is no collision at the moment, as that is a whole different topic that we'll tackle in a future video. Our scene consists of a grid map, a spatial node called player, and a timer node called map update timer. Map update timer's timeout signal gets passed to grid map and the timer has the auto start attribute set to true. Both player and map update timer are children of grid map. Player also has child nodes, a mesh instance for displaying the capsule mesh and the camera. The camera is placed above the player and rotated to give us a bird's eye view on the scene and to follow the player. For the grid map we need a mesh lip in order to place meshes on the grid. For this example project I decided to use simple cube shapes in different colors, as you can see in this scene. The order of the meshes is important for the selection later on. So move them in this separate seam accordingly, select them all and convert them to a mesh lip. Afterwards we go back to our main scene and assign the mesh lip to the grid map. The grid map attributes themselves are nothing special. The cell size is set to 111 and all center booleans are set to false. The grid map's position is at 000. You probably have noticed the attributes chunk width and chunk length. Those are here because of our procedure generator script. But we will talk about that later in detail. Instead, let's talk about the player next. Aside from placing the player a bit above the origin and rotating the mesh instance in the x-axis, there isn't really anything worth mentioning here. And we already talked about the camera. So let's hop into the player script attached to the player spatial node. As you can see, the player script is as simple as possible for this tutorial. In physics process, we set a motion vector based on the input of the player. Then the motion vector is multiplied with the speed constant and applied to the global position of the player. Now we are ready to talk about procedure generation and getting good performance. Grid maps consist of cells in which you can set meshes from your assigned mesh lib. Doing this via UI is quite easy. 
but it's also possible via the set cell item function. We'll have to call this function for every cell of our grid map. When we do this on startup, we'll have to deal with significant load times. So while we need to call this function a lot in order to have a consistent world to show to the player, we also need to make sure that as few calls as possible are performed in any given frame. This includes the startup frames. The most straightforward way to balance world consistency and processing time is to only call set cell item for cells that are currently in the immediate area of the player. And that's exactly what procedural generator will do for us. Let's go over the ready function first. With randomize, we initialize our random number generator in GDScript. After that, we define the size of our height map texture, which also defines the size of our world. Then, we initialize the actual noise of the height map texture by creating a new open simplex noise and giving it a random seed. Lastly, when the game starts up, we want a part of the map to be already visible. That's why we call set grid chunk. As we are starting on position 00, we want the according chunk to be visible as well. With that, we have an initial chunk visible. But when the player moves, we need to make new chunks visible. One idea would be to make a new chunk visible each time the player moves. But here's the catch. If we do that, we might end up calling set cell item for a lot of cells that were already processed last frame. Even if our terrain can change, it is very unlikely that a lot of cells change from one frame to another. All this additional and mostly pointless processing will lead to frame drops in the game. That's why I went for a different solution. Instead of updating the chunk area every frame the player moves, chunks are updated on a set timer. The timer in question is map update timer, which in my case updates every tenth of a second. This is about six times less than updating on player movement at 60 FPS. So that reduces not only the total amount of calls for a set cell item, but makes it also much more likely to process new cells while moving the player. Even if we do process cells we already processed before, that's not a big deal, as we don't do it as often. Also, again, maybe the terrain can change dynamically. Updating the same cells 10 times per second should be enough to perform terrain changes. That solution is why we call the timeout signal of map update timer in the procedural generator script of the grid map. In there we call generate grid chunk and pass the player's global position as an argument. So what's generate grid chunk? As you can see, all it does is convert the player's position to map coordinates of the grid map. Based on that, the new borders of the grid map chunk are calculated. Then we call set grid chunk with set borders. As we can see, the majority of the logic happens in set grid chunk. So let's go over that. First, we need to make sure that the past borders are valid, meaning still on the map. We don't want to set a cell that isn't part of the map anymore. So column start and row start are not allowed to be smaller than zero and the end variables are not allowed to be bigger than the texture width or height. Now we get to the part that takes all the processing time. In two for loops we iterate over the area we want to cover as the current grid chunk. Then we get the noise value for the current position to figure out how many blocks in Y are placed at the current position. 
In the third loop, we can then place each block by calling setCellItem and assign the mesh ID based on the height value. That's why I said earlier that the order of our meshes in the meshlib matters. With the code explained, let's talk more about some of the decisions I made. When looking at how we are using the noise texture, you might ask yourself why we are using it at all instead of pure randf. That's because pure randf wouldn't create smooth transitions between the different height levels. The different height level surfaces would also be much smaller in size and change more frequently, which is just unnatural. Interestingly, even though we perform the noise calculation via a texture, we don't actually need to get the noise values from the texture. With getNoise2D, we can access the noise value for a given cell directly from the algorithm. We don't have an overhead by locking the image data of the noise texture and iterating over each pixel. That's great for our case, so we just use get noise2d. After all this work, we should have a procedural generated map and a game that always runs at 60 fps, right? Well, not quite. While initially everything seems fine, you'll notice after a few minutes of generating map chunks that the frame rate drops to single digits. That's obviously unacceptable for any game, so we'll address that specific problem in the next video. That's it for today. Thank you very much for watching this video and until next time, bye bye.